So we know the importance of our sweet fur babies, and then we introduce our baby babies. And <laughs> Sometimes it can be challenging. So tonight we're gonna answer your questions. We're gonna cover a number of different topics related to that. But before we get started, I just want to welcome you. Um, I'm your host, Sierra Bragan, the owner and founder of Miami Mom Collective. We are Miami's premier parenting resource. We love to bring great resources to moms, to families, to put them right into your hands. And so here we are tonight. It's a joy to partner with um, You Health Jackson Children's Care and the great work that they are doing. And this series has really just been incredibly helpful, incredibly enlightening, and also so timely. It's like each seminar that we have, it's just a topic that either is on the forefront of everyone's mind or something that we haven't thought about maybe regularly, but that is very, very important to cover. So I feel like that is tonight's topic. It's something maybe sometimes we can forget about, even if we don't have pets. I don't personally have pets, um, but we are around them. My in-laws have them, our friends have them. And so it's things that we're dealing with as parents and we need to know the best safety measures around um, our fur friends and our children. So excited to jump right in. I wanna take a minute and let you know a few things about you Health Jackson Children's Care. You may not be aware, but the pediatric emergency rooms at Holtz Children's Hospital, as well as Jackson North are available to you 24 seven. Now I always say, I hope you never ever need them, but if you do, they're available 24 seven. And actually Holtz Children's offers a 24 hour kids only emergency room. So that's great news. Your kids can stay separate from all the adult things that happen in an emergency room. But all of the staff there are board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists. And as a patient there, you're also getting um, great access to every pediatric subspecialist. So you're getting care from those in the University of Miami Health System, as well as the Jackson Health System. So um, additionally, at the Holtz Children's Hospital, the doctors and the nurses are all certified in pediatric advanced life support. So um, I say that saying, I hope that you never need to visit the ER, but we just want to remind you that the best care is available to you there in 24 hour kids only at Holt. So great news about that, especially in these times. But um, we have two wonderful guests with us tonight and I'm excited to introduce you to them. We are gonna have kind of a two part evening. So we're gonna meet first with um, Dee Holt, who is with us. She is a certified dog behavior consultant and the CEO of Applause Your Paws Incorporated. So welcome Dee, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I was definitely excited to come talk on this topic. So thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, I was checking out your bio and I'm excited to share with our viewers because you have so much wisdom and experience and uh, really this is your niche and you've got all of the expertise on it. So we're excited to dive right in tonight. Dee currently serves, like I said, as the CEO of Applause Your Paws Incorporated. This is Miami's largest privately owned positive dog training company. And her company's mission is to help dog owners improve their quality of life through enjoyable and connected relationships with their canine friends. And she does this by providing engaging, positive education, non-intimidating training, so that in any environment, they can have the well-behaved dog that they've always wanted. Now that makes me want to have a dog because <laughs> in all honesty, I think, how am I going to train the thing, right? But you are the expert in that. And one of the things that's amazing about Dee and her experience is that she previously served for a four-year term on the board of directors for the South Florida Veterinary Medical Association and Foundation. And she's also served on the board of trustees for the Association of Professional Dog Trainers. Now, fun fact about D, fewer than 400, 400 trainers in the entire world hold the certified dog, um, the certified dog behavior consultant title. So for what 400 in the world, and D is one of those. So that's amazing that you're among that elite group. And I know that you're passionate not only about dog training and safety, but how that relates with our children as well. So welcome tonight. We are so glad that you are here. Um, and I wanna draw our attention, our guests that are listening, if at any time you have a specific question, you can use that Q and A feature on the bottom of your screen, type your question there, and we will do our best to get to those. But we've got a lot, so we're gonna, um, get started right here. Now talk to us, Dee, first off about, let's say two different scenarios. One would be bringing home a baby when you already have a dog. And sure. then another scenario would be when you have a baby and then you decide you're going to get a dog. 
and tell us how these situations would differ. Okay. Um, so those are two really great questions. And I, in my professional experience and opinion, I actually think bringing home a baby when you have an existing dog um, is a lot easier <laughs> than trying to bring a dog into the equation once you already have kids. But like anything Only else- Only one to potty train, right? <laughs> I know, right? Um, just as a mom, like, you know, my son is four and I feel like just now I'm starting to turn the corner where I'm like, I don't have to be so, like, you're always gonna have to be hypervigilant as a parent, but you don't have to be like as hypervigilant like he's functional if I leave the room for a second and come back. Um, but you know, when you're bringing a baby home, uh, my joke is kind of like the first, let's say six months that you have that baby in the house, your job is to keep your baby safe from the dog. Okay. And that is actually really easy to do with good management and just paying attention, right? Supervision, what we call adult awake supervision, because that's much different, um, for dog trainers than, people who are watching, but aren't paying attention. Right. That's right. right? So like, I'm, I'm totally awake. Watching. yeah, well, like, no, you're not watching. Um, and then when, once you have, uh, like a crawling right baby in the house or one that's sitting up tummy time, whatever, now your job is to keep your dog safe from your kid. Mm-hmm. And that is actually going to be your job for the next like four years. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so that's a much longer stretch, but I think the scenario where you have a newborn at home is way easier um, than having to keep your dog safe from your child, because that's such a longer period of time. Um, And so to answer your second question about like, you know, when do you introduce a dog right into the family? You know, again, my son is four. So every, all of my advice kind of revolves around the stage of development my son is in right now and the interactions I see between my personal three dogs and him. Um, and I actually think that, you know, this age is really lovely to bring a puppy home, you know, like, so if you're going to do it, like maybe wait till your kids are like three or three or four, depending on, you know, your, your, you know, your own child, right. Your child's ability to listen and follow directions and communicate with you. Um, and if you want to wait even a little bit longer, I mean, I think kids who are like seven, eight, nine. I mean, they make like the best dog trainers ever. So, um, but, but I think it would now would be a good time. Like with Jack being four, if I was going to bring a puppy in, um, I think that's a really beautiful age to bring a dog into the family and raising a, a puppy is, uh, a lot of work, but you know, we can talk more about the safety elements, you know, with that, but it's, uh, it'll be a challenge (laughs) if you decide to do that. (laughs) That, no, yeah, that's great. Um, this is good. I have, I say, I have three children, so I'm like, have enough animals of my own thus far. But maybe when they're a little bit older, that's good news to know. Maybe yeah. when like the oldest, the youngest one is four, we might be in a good place. Um, talk to me about a little bit more on that question. But like, if say we already have a dog and we're bringing home an infant, like, what's the best way to like make an introduction to the dog and the baby? You know, I'm, I'm thinking like, you don't just walk in and set the the car seat in the floor, right. let the dog just sniff the baby. What's the best way to do that? You know, when it comes to newborns and dog interactions, slow and steady really wins the race. Because what you have to remember is that unless your dog like has the unusual experience that it's been around hundreds of infants in its life, chances are this is the very first experience your dog is going to have with this like weird alien squirrel living in your house, right? right. And so- <laughs> Um, as much as people want to just kind of like jump right in, I think that can set them up for failure in a lot of ways. And so I just try to remind, you know, parents that are going to be bringing the baby home to the dog for the first time. There's no rush. There's no rush. And so, you know, you can have the dog behind a baby gate. You can have your significant other holding the leash. You can have your dog in the crate and, you know, give yourself a couple of days to just like get home and get used to the fact that you're caring for a baby now. Like the nurses aren't there anymore. (laughs) right? You're not in the hospital. Like this is all really overwhelming and new and your kid and your dog presumably are going to live together for quite some time. So there's no rush to introduce them. When you finally do feel comfortable, you know, as a mom or as a parent, allowing some closer contact, um, I do like for the dog to be leashed so that someone has control of that dog, just in case the dog has a negative reaction. It's just not worth the risk to do otherwise. And the same is true of bouncy dogs, because a lot of people have really like, I use the, like the lab because that's like the quintessential hyper happy dog, right? 
but yeah. really friendly bouncy dogs can injure an infant very easily and accidentally. So it's not just about the dog becoming aggressive. It's about the dog just yeah. becoming so excited in any right. state of arousal, whether that's aggression or just joy, right? It's right. still arousal. So someone has to have control of that dog. Um, I like the baby in some sort of like swaddle or something where I have all their little limbs tucked in so that mm -hmm. when I allow my dog to um, like sniff and engage, they can't get curious at, with their mouth, you know, like my baby's protected. And then right. you kind of just want to do like slow, you know, sniffing, you know, introduction. So maybe the dog gets to sniff for three seconds, then the handler pulls the dog away, you know, praise the dog, reward the dog for any good interactions and then repeat and then pull the dog away and then repeat. And you want to do these like slow little tests, you know, until you feel more comfortable because you'll be able to tell pretty quickly if it's a comfortable interaction or not a comfortable interaction for the dog. So your, your baby's clueless, right? So <laughs> at that point, like you probably have a ton of parenting wisdom too, because I feel like it can't be that much different, right? Like training a child and training it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that is, but I'm, I'm, you must be an amazing parent too. So on that note, um, you know, you bring the baby home and then kind of create the dog for a minute. And then, you know, your fur baby's over there sad. What are stressor yeah. signals maybe to look for in your dog? in these kind of, you know, sure. these changes or interactions. With yeah, kids. that's a great question. So, um, you know, I highly advise that if you aren't, you know, as, if you're listening to this and you're in this lecture, learning about this topic, if you aren't already familiar with some of the common like stress body language, um, take some time and just get on Google and type in like stress signals in dogs, you know, and there's so many wonderful infographics and stuff that can show you um, or if you ever get a chance to jump on uh, with the lectures that I do specific to uh, dogs and, and expecting parents, I go over that in a lot of detail with my presentations with Jackson. Um, but, you know, some subtle ones that people tend to miss, dogs yawn, and they yawn out of the context of being tired. So the dog is there, isn't, didn't just wake up, it's not sleepy, and it's yawning. Um, that's what we consider like as a, you know, dog behavior expert, a low level stress signal. But dogs actually give that signal a lot. And, you know, for any of you here on um, this presentation that have a dog, I bet you, you see stress yawns in other contexts and you just maybe never realized that's what it was because a lot of dogs will stress yawn when they've been isolated for a period of time. So like their owner goes to work and then you come back. So the dog's been isolated for, you know, seven, eight hours, you come back and the dog gets so overwhelmed by the reunion that it starts to yawn. Like the feelings your dog has, even though they're joy are so overwhelming, it stresses mm -hmm. out your dog. Hmm. So a lot of dogs will yawn in that context. Um, and usually when they're stressed by an infant crying, you'll see them yawn. Um, you see them do what's called avoidance behavior, which is pretty self-explanatory. Like they look around, like they're looking for the exit. So avoidance behavior doesn't necessarily mean that the dog like moves to the other end of the room because right. that's actually the conflict that dogs have in homes with infants or small children. They want to stay with the adult. Okay. Mm. But they're stressed out by your baby, but they're not right. going to leave because they want to stay with the adult. And then they okay. get themselves so Good stressed point. out. They bite your kid. Like that's the domino effect that happens. And people go, well, if the kid's stressing you out, why don't you just go somewhere else? And I say, well, because the dog's attached to you. It's lived with you for the last right. five years. It's not going to leave you. <laughs> right. so yeah, um avoidance behavior yeah the avoidance behavior you're looking for really is the dog doing this like they <laughs> literally just start looking for somewhere to go like can i go somewhere should i go somewhere i don't know i'm conflicted mm -hmm. i don't know where to go yeah um right and then, you know i'm trying to think of any other um you know stress related behaviors they do uh usually after being touched they do like a shake off what's called a shake off so it'd be like a dog that's wet, that shakes off water, except there's no water. So a lot of dogs okay. will do that okay. to release tension or relax themselves when okay. they've just finished or are in the middle of a, like a, a highly stressful event. Wow. That's so interesting. Wow. I'm like, want to go Google the infographics now. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is helpful. Talk to us about what are the top 10 commands to teach our dogs? Sure. So... I would say as a, if I can think back to like when Jack was an infant, right? Probably telling my dog to get out of my way was a big one. 
Like it's laying yeah. in the middle yeah. of the yeah. hall and I'm trying to walk with my baby down the hall and I'm like, move, you know, so move yeah. is a big one. And right. then I want the, I want the basics to sit down, stay or wait. Um, I do need my dog to be able to come when I call him because here's the perfect example. Like, you know, I get to where my, my infant is able to be placed down on the floor on a blanket. They're maybe playing, you know, on their back with one of those little like activity dangly centers. My yep. dog is laying politely there next to my baby, but then I have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. So what's easier taking your kid or taking your dog? Yeah. Take the dog, yeah. right? Take the dog. <laughs> so the dog come, you know, reliably needs to call away with you. And then while I'm in the bathroom, I put my dog on a downstay because at that point, there's nothing in the living room except for my son, Jack. So he's fine and he's not crawling. So he's not going anywhere. Right. Right. So right. your dog being able to come when you call it is really relevant for those scenarios in your house where you are going to leave your infant somewhere, but your dog also has to be accounted for, <laughs> you know, Good. Um, Good. and then leave it or like, I guess kind of the word no is tied into that, but drop it and leave it become important as time goes on because you can imagine it, I would just envision your house with three kids, right? Like the amount of toys and socks and like all sorts of things that are very interesting to dogs. I, I would hope that your dog's gonna release those things when they end up in its mouth because it's not realistic to think your dog's never gonna touch your kid's stuff. Right, right, that's yeah. good. I laugh, um, uh, side note, someone told me <laughs> with your third baby, you know, the first child, if you drop the passy on the ground, you're like, oh, let's sterilize it and get a new one, you know? <laughs> The second right. child, it's like, you kind of rub it on your shirt and make, you know, spit shine it. But the third one, the mom said, yeah, the third one, you just take it out of the dog's mouth and give it to your kid. <laughs> it's funny it's how, how, it's how you build a strong immune system. system. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. Well, um, talk to us about, you know, in a similar way, what are some commands or rules that we should try to instill in our children as they learn to play with dogs? Fantastic. I love that question. Cause I feel like that is the thing that gets overlooked. And mm -hmm. I have to remind myself to always be, um, you kind of alluded to this a little while ago, but to be really gentle when I give parenting advice. And I think we all have to do that, right? Because we're yeah. all gonna have our own parenting style and that's always like a hard thing to approach. Um, right. But I really do feel like parents are missing the boat on teaching their kids appropriate manners with the dog mm -hmm. from the time that their children are aware that the dog exists. And so I don't know, Sierra, I mean, you, you are on a whole nother level of momness than me, but like, at what age would you say your kids, your kids are aware that familiar objects are in the room? I mean, what is that like three months? Yeah. Months? Oh, like, I mean, little, very little. Yeah. Right. And I even think now, and, and I'm going to ask you specifically too, because sure. selfishly I have a two-year-old who oh. loves the puppies, you know? And so like, he's just been introduced to them in the last year because they're at my in-laws house, but he mm -hmm. loves them. And so he gets a little, I get nervous that he's too comfortable, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so like you're saying, having rules and commands with our children to be able to protect them, their mm -hmm. safety as well. So helpful. So speak to us about the little ones and then yeah. up on the toddler. So I can remember like when Jack was probably again, like three, four months old, like he could already hold up his neck and I would put him in one of those little Fisher Price seats where like it would support his back, but he could sit there with his head up, you know, and kind of touch like things in front of him. And right. from that age, even if he would grab for the dog or do anything sudden, which again, like is really outside of his skill set at that point, right? Because we're just starting right. to develop motor skills, but still the messaging already has to be there from the parents. Like we always reach slowly for the dog, you know, like when we reach fast, it might scare the dog. And so mm -hmm. I've been explaining to my son since he could understand me, which I felt was that early, you know, like he could really understand right, what right. I was telling him. Um, I've been telling him we approach dogs slowly. We don't get in their face. We don't hug dogs. We don't grab dogs. Yeah. We don't sit on dogs. We don't go into their bed. We don't go into like, it's like, we don't do this. We don't do this. We don't do this. Right. Yeah. So we, like I can write you a whole list here of things that parents expect their dogs to tolerate. And I'm sorry yeah. to say it, it's wrong. <laughs> like right. it's right. wrong and we're setting our yeah. kids up to get bitten in the face. Like that's what's yeah. actually sadly happening, right? right. Um, right. And the messaging I would train my son, right? Tell Jack was, um, but here's some fun things we can do with the dog. We can yeah. feed the dog treats. Mm -hmm. We can throw treats at the dog. Awesome. Yeah. Now we don't have to touch the dog, just throw food yeah. at the dog. <laughs> the Your four month old would love to throw food at a dog. Trust me, like, yeah. that would be amazing, right? <laughs> we can throw the ball for the dog. We can brush the dog that comes later on. 
Um, right. you know, and then once my son was mobile, I really had to stay on him to enforce the rules. When the yeah. dog is laying down, we don't go near the dog. Yeah. Why don't you go over here instead? Let me call the dog to us. Come here. Right. Come here, Flux. Come over here. Jack wants to pet you. Hey, Jack, yeah. Flux isn't coming. That means he doesn't want to be pet right now. So we're going to leave yeah. him alone, That's you know, true. and just clearly articulating it like over and over and over. And now that he's four, he knows all the rules. So That's if you're true. waiting until your kid is like three or later to start yeah training them about how to approach dogs it's too late right, it's too right. late like that already has to be ingrained by the time they're even just sitting up and like aware of you know because kids right. are sponges i mean you know like, they're so it's, yeah. it's incredible how early they mm -hmm. can learn stuff mm -hmm. just that that getting in the habit that's what we do with anything as a parent is mm -hmm. narrating what's happening around us you know yes. that's what they have a lot for small children just talk to them about what you're doing we're changing your diaper now we're doing you know they can't verbalize back to you, but just getting ourselves in the habit of communicating our expectations so that we're always communicating them. So then later right. when they, it does just click. So that's good. That's good advice. And explaining and explaining why not just, we don't grab fast at the dog because he doesn't like it. Yeah. Like that's not descriptive yeah. enough, you know, like, yeah. so yeah, just, we, we got to just why. be careful that as we're, yeah, as we're explaining to our kids, we're very clear over and over, like what can happen? The dog could bite you. The dog could right. hurt you. You might make the dog yeah. feel angry. You might make him feel scared. And mm -hmm. you know what, or when kids are around three, like, I think that's when they start being able to understand some of those emotions too. So, right. And they, they yeah. get that. It's like, Good. Oh, I, the dog feels scared right now. The dog feels sad right now. The dog feels happy right now. Yeah. That's Good. All right. What about, is there a difference <laughs> in different breeds? I, I kind of feel like, yes. And <laughs> how they respond to kids. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, traditionally our, uh, what I, I, I'd refer to as like our gun dogs, our retrievers, that class of dogs was bred to be super tolerant of noise and touch and temperature and just about everything. So yes, a dog is still a dog and there's an inherent bite risk with any dog living with your kid, but retrievers are pretty solid. Like generally speaking, it takes a lot to push a retriever over that threshold where something scares them because yeah. most of the dog bites that are going to happen come from come from a place where the dog is frightened feels like it doesn't have an escape feels like the adult handler isn't advocating for it and it says well if you're not right. going to do something about yeah. this kid i will right and most right. dog bites yeah. that happen right. happen right. because the dog hit the limit and they're usually like like a, like a pop, like a bite pop and a release. Like they're not going to like attack your kid viciously. It's usually like a single right. bite and a release. And that's a distance creating right. behavior. They're just saying back off, you know, right. um, get away. Yeah. and it, it get away. And it, it takes a lot for a like a retriever type dog to do that. They're more inclined to like, get up and move away, get up and move yeah. away, get up and move, like a yeah. hundred times, get up and move away. <laughs> leave me alone, kid. Yeah. Leave me alone. Please, 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 please leave me alone. Like they'll just give a lot of, they're very tolerant. Um, a lot of your bully breeds, and again, depending on how and how that dog was bred and what lineage it's from, the bully mm -hmm. breeds can actually be quite tolerant also. They really can okay. because they're tough dogs. They're not very touch sensitive. Right. So a lot of them can withstand a little bit of grabbing here and there. Okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> when you look at things like our more sensitive dogs, like the herding breeds, our Australian okay. Shepherds, our Border Collies, um, even a German Shepherd, that's still a herding breed. Um, okay. dogs that were bred to control movement, uh, they tend to be a lot less tolerant. It. They're going to control yeah. it. They're yeah. a lot less tolerant of kids because kids are noisy. They don't like that. It's erratic. They don't like it. Kids move really fast. They want to do a gathering behavior, which is in their DNA mm -hmm. to make all the livestock stand still in like a clump. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of bite incidents happen with those particular breeds because people are getting these mini Aussies because they're so cute and they're Merle coats. Like I see it all the time. Like, oh, my mini Aussie bit, my mini Aussie bit, my kid. I'm like, yeah, because uh, your mini Aussie shouldn't be living with a kid. Yeah. <laughs> like, get it not, a sheep. Yeah, get your dog a sheep. <laughs> get it a sheep. Exactly. Get it some sheep, you know? Um, but then again, I live with two border collies, uh, but I live with two border collies and a child knowing yeah. what I signed up for, you know? That's and right. I have one high drive border collie who wishes he had sheep. And I have to very carefully manage the interaction so that 
he doesn't think Jack is sheep. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then my mm-hmm. other border collie is very low drive. He has no interest in sheep. So well. there you go. <laughs> He's and I have a, I love it. Yeah. And then, I, yeah. And then I have a Labrador who like, honestly, I told my husband the other day, cause we, um, our dogs spend a lot of time outside just cause they're active and they love it. But then they come in at night with us or when I can be on and I can supervise, then of course I let them in to interact. But just like you have three kids, it's a lot. I don't need three dogs and my four-year-old all run, running around my house. Like that's a right. lot for me to parent in one go. Okay. Right. That's right. Um, and again, you appreciate that. Cause like you, it's impossible to watch all three of your kids simultaneously. If they're running in different directions, you're like, that's right. <laughs> but that's how I feel with three dogs and a kid. So dogs Amazing. spend time outside and inside back and forth. But my point is I told my husband the other day, I had the border collies, um, behind a baby gate in my house so that I don't have to think about them. I don't have to parent them for a second. Right. Right. So they're just <laughs> calmly laying down behind a gate. And Jack is running through the house, running through the house, playing, playing, screaming, having a great time. And our Labrador is just like laying there and she's going like this. She's like watching him, (laughs) watching him. And I turn to Sam and I go, I don't know why we don't do this more often. Like we'll usually leave her outside and then we'll bring in the calm border collie and then we'll rotate the other one. And then all of a sudden I'm like, this is so stupid. She, her breed is less aroused by Jack than the border collies and just this last week i'm like she can be in the house all the time like he's old enough now that i totally trust her and him together all the time but that's a labrador right wow (laughs) yeah and you're also one of 400 in the world trained so let's not give you any you know (laughs) um Dean, talk to us about, and you've mentioned a little bit of this, but, but quickly, we have lots of questions. I want to make sure we get to all of them, but what can parents do to model good dog interaction behavior for our child? Oh, that is a great question too. All your questions are so good. Um, (laughs) so the, so the big thing that I remind parents with dogs in the house is don't do anything to your dog, even if it's lovingly that you wouldn't want your child imitating Mm. if they go to a friend's house with a dog that they don't know. Mm. And so a big mistake that parents make is they allow their children to visibly observe hugging of the dog, kissing of the dog's face, smothering the dog. And your dog might enjoy those kind of interactions from your family. That does not mean that dogs enjoy that from strangers. Oh yeah, that's good. So I don't, I recently, I'm starting to relax on that again, because he's four but I was very careful to like only kiss my dogs after Jack was in bed at night Mm -hmm. and I don't hug them and I don't do anything that I wouldn't want him to mimic because they just mimic everything. So he only got to observe me again, giving dogs treats, uh, giving dogs commands, like actively training, which now at four years old, Jack can train a dog to sit and down and stay and go to a place and go in your kennel. Like he knows all the commands and how to train them, which is awesome. And he loves it. Um, so kids enjoy watching you interact with a dog in a training way. Like that's really fun for kids to do. Um, he observed me throwing balls for the dog, right? So that's something he can do. Um, and I had to correct myself because I used to play tug with the dogs in front of him. And then Mm -hmm. I realized they're way too strong for him. And so like, if he went to go try to play tug, like they would hurt him by accident. So I quit doing that. Um, I love what you said about thinking about what translates, you know, scenario to scenario. Cause we kind of think, oh, our dog is like this, but you've got to think about seeing a dog in the street or seeing a dog at a friend's house exactly. or whatever. So that's really yeah. good advice. You, and you actually just reminded me of something. One thing I've been saying to Jack since the very beginning, cause you said like your two-year-old gets excited to see mo- your mom's dog, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have, have always kind of said to Jack, whenever we see a dog on the street, I purposely move him to like the op, like I'm the buffer in between that person, their dog and my kid. So I move him to the other side of me. I said, Hey, Jack, um, let's walk a little bit more over here because that dog doesn't know us. Yeah. And, and I want to give him some space in case he's scared of kids. I said, in case he's scared of kids. And I would say that over and over and over and over. And Jack actually will say that to other children, like give him space. He might be scared of kids. Give him space, give him space. Like, I think it makes Jack nervous when he sees kids just going up to dogs, you know, but it was never, it was never Jack. Don't do that. You're going too close. Like it's about the animals feelings. 
Like right, right, right. I don't tell Jack, don't go near that dog because you don't know that dog. Right. I say the dog right. doesn't know you and he yeah. may not like children. Yeah. So yeah. Jack will meet a, a meet a dog and go, that. mommy, does that, does that yeah. dog like children? I said, I don't know. Let's ask, let's ask the owner, you know? And then yeah. the question I want to ask the owner is, um, is your dog used to being around kids? Yeah. Not, is your dog friendly? That's the wrong question to ask. Everyone goes, oh yeah, my dog's friendly. Yeah. I go, is your, is your dog, you, yeah, of course they are. Ah, bite my kid. Like, you know, yeah, because people right. don't realize, people don't even know that their dog would bite a child because they just assume it's so friendly with adults, it's going to be friendly with children. So yeah. I say, is your dog used to being around kids? And if they go, oh, no, not really. I go, okay, hey, Jack, listen, that dog, he's not used to being around kids. So let's just give him some space. Okay, thanks, bye. That's, That's good. That's a good question. And instead of like, oh, like instilling fear in our own children going, oh, here comes a dog, watch out. You know, like it's, it's putting right. words to it. So I really like that. I'm going to use that because we see dogs a lot on walks, you know, it's really good. Um, yeah, what are and my... I think it, it teaches, yeah, oh, it sorry. teaches respect for the animal too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I was good. just saying, I That's think it great. just really, that messaging helps teach respect to the animal. Like it has its own feelings. It has its mm -hmm. own needs. It's not, it's not just a pet in our house. Like it's more than that. And we have to respect how it feels. That's great. That's great. What are ways that, and you touched on this earlier, but that parents can prepare their dog and home for when your child begins to crawl and walk, you know, we talk about baby proof our home, but how can we do that yeah. for preparing our dogs in our home? Awesome. So, um, you know, I think definitely parenting dogs and kids, I can appreciate how challenging it must be when you're dealing with 800 or 900 square feet, right? So if you're living in an apartment, that's going to be a lot more challenging than if you have a house where you can segregate a dog behind a gate down a hall or put the dog outside for a little bit. Um, but the big key is to have some, you know, gates in place or a room that you can close, you know, your dog in if they need a break um, to keep your dog comfortable. Because the perception is that like, I'm going to put my dog behind the baby gate because I need to isolate my dog from the interaction. And mm -hmm. that's not what it is. Like you, you're doing your dog a favor because trust me, there's very few dogs on the planet that want to spend every waking moment with a kid. <laughs> children are just inherently annoying to dogs they are they really are and so yeah. you're doing your dog a favor by saying okay you're gonna go be in the room right now with a bone enjoy yeah, or, yeah, yeah. okay you're gonna go into your crate for a little bit and just decompress and, and I'm gonna teach my child no one's gonna bother you there um which before I forget I'll just throw this out there um when Jack was smaller not anymore but when he was a lot smaller I had a crate cover um you can buy them on Amazon which is awesome so mm -hmm. when I put a dog in a crate in the house to give the dog a break with a bone or something, I could zip the whole thing up. And there's some mesh parts where, again, it's really breathable for the dog, but a little one can't stick any fingers into the cage. So like if you turn your back for a second or something, they're not gonna accidentally like stick a finger in and get bitten. So right. um, crate, crate covers are a great way to like make a safe space for your dog. If let's say your house or apartment doesn't lend itself to like, putting a baby gate somewhere because that might not be a solution for everybody but a crate is a solution for everybody so just keep getting a good crate cover in mind to reduce the risk of like wandering fingers getting through the cage that's great d that's great you are a wealth of information <laughs> um okay i, I, I want to transition we want to um get to dr or, i'm sorry ozzy drago here in a second specifically about what heaven forbid does happen if your child gets bitten but last question, I want you to speak to this is, this is really your wheelhouse, but when is it necessary to seek professional help training, you know, or behaviorists for our dogs? Sure. Um, so firstly, I want to say that just like every other professional that's out there to help people, like dog trainers are no different, right? And so when it comes to um, behavior cases, I think a lot of people are hesitant to like call the dog trainer because they suddenly think like, oh my God, this is going to cost me like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Like I don't, I'm hesitant to do it. Um, but working through behavior challenges is a bit different than doing like an obedience program, which is very like cookie right. cutter. It's, you know, five to six weeks, la, 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 la. Right. Uh -huh. um, when you deal with like a behavior consultant or a trainer that specializes in behavior, you're looking at maybe one or two times that that professional is going to come out 
um, to your house to help you. And typically you would want to call like a dog behavior professional when you're having a hard time identifying why your dog is being aggressive or why your dog is behaving a certain way. Because if you can't identify what the trigger is, then you can't manage the situation properly. Right. right. And, um, you know, like I've been out to behavior, this is not to do with kids, but like I've been out to behavior consults in my career where there's two dogs fighting in the home. And it was, for me, it was as simple as being like, oh, well, you, you need to move that coffee table, like two feet back. Wow. Like it just wasn't enough space for the animals, you know? So sometimes the solution is actually a lot clearer to someone like me and it's worth it to say I need a little bit of support because I can't figure out why my dog is behaving a certain way um and most you know yeah and most dogs like yes parenting dogs and kids is challenging but there's very very few dogs that have to be rehomed because we can't make it work like that's a very small percentage of dogs And I know it's hard work, but a trained professional, (laughs) you know, in dog behavior should be able to help you uh, not only put more obedience training on your dog, but manage certain situations at different developmental stages for your kid. So that's great. Dee, thank you. I appreciate just so much information um, and just thankful for your wisdom. And we're going to transition now um ozzy drago how, how did you like that ozzy i totally promoted you to doctor just like no thing right there yeah, I, you doctor. No, I loved it i was gonna wear my white coat you know i, I love it i love it um ozzy is the associate director of patient care services for you health jackson urgent care he o- oversees jackson's five urgent care locations in miami-dade county so you're not busy at all i'm sure <laughs> um <laughs> he earned his associate's degree in nursing from miami-dade college and a bachelor's degree in health services administration from Bear University. He's been a nurse for 14 years. And before becoming a nurse, he was a basketball coach for 11 years. That's awesome. What a, a fun two careers that you've had. That sounds awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, quite a transition to go <laughs> from sure coaching basketball to nursing. You know? I love it. I love it. You probably could have used the nursing stuff when you were coaching basketball at times, I'm sure. I'm sure, sure you had situations. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. We want to jump right in now to specifically injuries and, you know, urgent care, how Jackson can help us there. But let's talk about animal bites. And does every animal bite require a doctor visit or an evaluation? Talk to us about that. Well, I just want to thank you first for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Important topic, most definitely. We love dogs, so that's great. Uh, Not every bite does require a doctor's evaluation. Um, I would say, you know, obviously, if there's a break in the skin, if you're having some bleeding, if you're having quite a bit of pain, I would definitely want to get evaluated. At, and urgent care is a good place to get evaluated for a dog bite. Um, yeah, if you're not sure of the where the the background of the dog, I would definitely get an evaluation. You know, like if it's a strange dog or a stray dog or something like that, I would definitely get an evaluation. That's good. Yeah, because if it's your dog, at least you know kind of – that it's had its um, shots and that kind of thing, you know where it's coming from. But um, so I guess to that note, does every dog bite require like a rabies shot? Like if you get bit or if you go to the urgent care, they're going to immediately give you a rabies shot. How does that work? Well, you know, uh, so everyone knows that urgent care does not provide rabies shots. And I believe not even many emergency rooms provide it anymore. Sometimes you have to get it at the Department of Health. Um, but not every dog okay. bite requires rabies shots. That would have to lean more towards, again, not knowing the background of the dog. So if it's your right. own dog, you know, if it's a neighbor's dog, you would know if it's had its shot. Um, obviously, if it's a wild animal, you know, you're not sure, you definitely want to get evaluated. And most possibly, you know, you can kind of tell they, sometimes the, the animal is, you're able to catch the animal or know the animal and say, okay, this animal doesn't look right. It's foaming, you know, you're not really sure. So it may have something going on. Um, you know, we have a lot of animals here in South Florida, raccoons, you know, uh, possums, things like that. Those animals are that you definitely want to get evaluated and you may need a rabies shot for them. that's right that's right i'll never forget i was a, a director of a school years ago and at a family day we had a kid get bit by an iguana and i remember thinking mm. oh my goodness only in miami first of all yeah. but yeah i mean just you just never know when a situation like that would happen but it's good to know that yeah. those urgent cares are which are available all throughout the city um, are a good place to start so if our child is bitten what exactly should we do 
I think the first thing you need to do is obviously wash it, you know, soap and water, run lots, run it with lots of water, soap and water. If it's bleeding, you want to stop the bleeding um, and, you know, you know, bandage it, however it may be. A couple of things to know, a lot of times with um, bites, animal bites, um, cat scratches, things like that, um, we do uh, recommend, a doctor will recommend a tetanus shot. So that would be depending on the age of the child and where they are with their own shot, okay? Um, sometimes if it's also what's important for everybody to know, which they don't realize, is if, it's a, if the injury is a deep cut, you know, if it's a cut and it's quite, a laceration is pretty deep, they won't suture it right. when it's a bite from an animal. They're going to leave it open because they need to be able to, if it's going to be an infection, they won't leave it open so they won't suture it as when it's a bite from an animal. Wow, interesting. Okay, that, that's interesting. Uh, makes sense, but I never thought about that. What sign, so you know, clean it Sarah good, soap and water. Make sure clean it good, clean it good, soap and water. Sorry to interrupt, Sarah. Cleaning is really important. No, soap that's good. Water, I was, water. yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, I grew up in the generation of we put, <laughs> we put peroxide on everything. So I'm <laughs> like, soap and water is good. I can do that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I remember yeah, as a kid, yeah. that was awful. But soap and Absolutely. water. And then what signs or symptoms should we monitor for if our kid is bitten? Should we watch for anything else? You know, fever or I don't know. Yeah, no, that's great, Sarah. Absolutely. Fever is what you want to watch for. Pus, redness, swelling, and pain. If you're looking at pus, redness, swelling, and pain at the site of the injury, you definitely want to get them to the emergency room or to an urgent care. Good. Okay. Holtz children 24 hours a day. Because um, dogs <laughs> bite 24 hours a day. Yeah, they do. They <laughs> Sadly. Do. Um, what is the treatment for animal bites? Like if I, if I had a situation to kick him, you said they wouldn't suture it. Like what kind of, what do they do to treat something like that? You said tetanus shot. Most, of, most of the time they, they do tetanus shot. They want it depending on where they are with their shots in the age of the child. And they, do, they will prescribe an antibiotic. It's very common that they prescribe augmentin for bites and, and scratches from the okay. animal. Um, that, and they do, just so everyone knows, they do have to fill out an animal bite form. That bite form gets, um, submit it to the Department, you know, of, uh, I don't know if it's Department of Health, I think so, and they, um, it just goes on the record. Nothing happens to the animal, your animal, it's not a big deal, it's just so they have a record of what's going on with that animal. That's great, that's good. One thing I did, I've never really thought of, but I'm seeing how these kind of go in the same category, but let's talk about the difference in an allergic reaction to like a bite or a sting, because, you know, some animals, if you get bit by them, it could lead to an allergic reaction. Versus like if you're bit by a dog, perhaps it would be more like an infection could happen. So talk to us about the sure. difference between the two. Sure. Well, allergic reaction, you know, a lot of people, like I myself, I'm allergic to cats and I get, you know, swelling of my eyes, you know, maybe a little trouble breathing. So, you know, allergic reaction, you want to look for that. You know, if there's any swelling in areas that, you know, not even away from the bite. A lot of times in allergic reaction, you'll see a rash, you know, come from uh, areas that are away from the bite, you know. An infection, as I, as I discussed before, is you're looking for pus, redness, and pain, and fever. You want to make sure if you're, if you're starting a fever, that's definitely signs of infection. Okay. Oh, so scary. There's so many things out there, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The allergic reaction, you think a bee sting, you know. It's like a bee could sting anybody, Absolutely. but it can be a lot more traumatic for someone who ha certainly has an allergy. Um, okay, and so you mentioned antibiotics, like you said, maybe Augmentin, if someone needs an antibiotic for a treatment, obviously, you know, it could be case by case, but um, a child could need antibiotics even for a bite. So that's why I guess it's a good, it's a good thing to get it checked out to not just assume, ah, mm -hmm. it's a bite, it's a cut, like any other cut, we'll just let it do. So um, that's good. That's good advice there. Yeah, um, definitely. What happens to out. a dog if what would happen to a dog, Ozzy, after it bites someone? I know you mentioned, you know, if it's your dog, it's just your dog. But, um, you know, if it's some dog in the street that's biting all the neighborhood kids, is that why it's reported in that form? Yeah, that's exactly why. So they, I'm, you know, they keep track of that because they want to see if there's a dog that, you know, there could be dogs that, you know, could be having an, another issue. And they want to keep track of there's a dog that's biting a lot of people. They want to take a look at it. Maybe that dog has, you know, something going on and they got to treat it. That's why it's biting, you know. We don't want to automatically assume that it's a dog with a problem. It's a dog that might need some help. So I, and now I remember it's animal services. We have a, a you know, it's a standard yeah. form. It's just filled out that it talks about the tetanus. It talks about um, antibiotics that's being treated. And it talks about the, the history of the dog in that form. That's great. That's good. Hey, Sierra. Wow, I'm learning so much. 
Hey, if I can jump in for, for please, one second. Please. So usually what happens when a dog bite gets reported to the county, it's a 10 day quarantine to make sure that animal doesn't have rabies. And if it's your own dog, then typically they don't do that. But let's say the neighbor's dog bit your kid. Chances are the neighbor would have a have a have um, an animal uh, officer come out to the house and evaluate the animal to make sure it's not dangerous. And then the animal would have to stay in quarantine for 10 days in the home. So a lot of people get nervous their dog's gonna be confiscated, but that doesn't happen unless it was a really serious bite incident. So you don't have to worry about that. Like just a home quarantine, which we're all familiar with now, what that's like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like quarantine, even the dogs, poor buddies. <laughs> Everybody's experienced it, right? Um, this is great information. Things that you don't think about unless you're in the moment. And I know if I, if my kid was bitten by a dog, I, I don't know that my first thought would be to go to the ER. It depends on the, the bite, but um, but certainly that's the great thing about urgent care is I feel like it's not as ER, you know, but it's still, you can get these these things addressed. So it's great that Jackie has so many locations near you if you're watching and tuning in. <laughs> um, what happens if the bite is caused by a wild animal? You know, you said possums or, you know, raccoons. Raccoon. Um, what, how does that look different? Well, I think that with that one, we they take more of a, a, a stand on the fact that it could very possibly be rabies because it's a wild animal. So that would be right. definitely going to the emergency room. Like I said, I'm not sure if they're doing rabies at the emergency room these days, but they'll be able to guide the patient and the family to how they get those rabies shots for their kids. Ooh, yeah, we don't want to get bit by a raccoon. That doesn't sound fun. Or an mm -hmm. iguana, which is a very Miami no, no, thing no. to happen. No. Yeah, stay away. I just tell my kids, just stay away from animals yeah, like that you don't need to really. touch. You know? Oh, that's good. A lot of this could could be avoided, you know, in some ways. But um, certainly, you know, animals like like you said, D, like they can be. They have emotions. They can be unpredictable at times. We don't know what you said about the animals in stress was really interesting. I've never thought about a dog exhibiting stress other than growling at someone or getting frustrated. So these are good things for me to note as I'm watching my children interact with animals, um, since we're not around them all the time, these are good things that I'm going to remember now too. So, um, Ozzy, thank you. Anything you would add, uh, just you. giving advice, you know, you're a dad, you've, you've seen, you're way ahead in the game than we are. You've, you're sending yours off to college now. So uh, um, just any tips for raising children in the home with animals? And then I'd love to hear the same as well from, uh, from Dee. Well, in my experience, it's really about you know, that knowledge, letting the child know, what, you know, this is an animal. We, we had an interesting experience with our first dog. We, we put it in a room. We thought that the room was perfect for that dog because um, it was kind of like it had its own little space and we didn't have to bother it when it needed to be on its own. But we didn't realize that that room was off to the side, like away from him. And the, she had quite a bit of anxiety, you know, separation anxiety from us. And she put like eight holes in the drywall, you know, and she's oh, not aggressive at all, oh, no. you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would say to, you know, to these words, you know, and, and her advice, you know, to try to, you know, inc incorporate them as a part of their life together. But, you know, keep them both safe. You know, hey, this is a dog and it has feelings. You have to understand it. And we've been blessed that, you know, our family has, you know, been able to interact with the dogs and understand the dog is a dog. And you need to take care of it and respect that. That's right. That's right. Ozzy, thank you. That's great. Good advice. Mm -hmm. Um, anything that you would add, Dee, just for raising children and dogs simultaneously? Not an easy task. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, just take it in stride. Like, I think depending on what dog you have, right? Because some are more challenging, some are less challenging. Um, and just when I'm thinking about it, like, just because the dog is small doesn't mean it's less challenging. Like, sometimes your small dogs are even more prone to bite kids because mm -hmm. they're too easy for the kids to harass. Like they're just small right. and they get irritated quicker because they feel picked on by children, you know? So yeah. just cause they're tiny, um, don't, you know, ignore that fact. Um, but yeah, I mean, just gosh, with Jack being four, it's amazing how fast just even four years has gone. And I think about all the stages of development that Jack has gone through. And I've, I've actually gone through two, I'm, I've had two sets of dogs because my older dogs aged out when Jack was two. And then four months, not even four months later, our new two puppies um, and Dakota came home. So we, I've gotten to live with like geriatric dogs raising my son and then also puppies. So I've seen like both ends of the spectrum. And you know, there's some days that are really high stress 
And then there's other days that you're like, this is amazing. And kids getting to have dogs is like the best thing ever. So just know that whatever stress you're having as it pertains to your dogs and your kids, it's probably going to be different in a couple of months because your kid's going to grow so fast. So don't sweat it. Use your baby gate, put your dog outside, do whatever you have to do to manage your stress level (laughs) because it will be worth it. It will be worth it in the long run. That's good. That's a good advice. Yeah. The seasons change so quickly. And Mm -hmm. I love what you said about, uh, I think sometimes we can forget. And again, I don't have a dog, but I, I watch friends who have babies and then they're like, I just feel like I'm neglecting my dog. But what you said about, yeah, sometimes they just need a minute, you know, throw them a bone and they're happy. So um, that's a (laughs) good piece of advice as well to know your dog. And, um, but just this, these tips were really helpful, very enlightening, good um, information. We just thank you both for joining us tonight. We're going to put up some information here on the screen for those of you watching. Um, Thank you for joining us. This is some resources for you that will be helpful. I want to um, also remind you, set a reminder on your phone. If you are on our email list, you will get a reminder. But four weeks from tonight on September 30th, we're going to have our next parental guidance episode and it is high risk pregnancies. So very relevant for families who are building their families. Maybe you're in the middle of pregnancy Maybe you're thinking one day to build your family, but um, pregnancy is truly a miracle, but sometimes you and your baby just can require a little extra care. And so many factors can lead to things as being classified as a high risk pregnancy um, and can put your baby at more risk, put you at more risk during and after delivery. So um, we are going to dive right into all of that that week. And, um, you know, just even the emotional toll that it can take on parents Um, bringing in a newborn to the world and then sending them to the ICU, you know, it's just more distress for parents, for children, all of it. So we're going to learn how we can prepare to take care of your baby and yourself medically, emotionally during that transition, that time. So make a note to join us on Thursday, September 30th for um, that one, high risk pregnancies. As always, this time is so informative. It's a great opportunity for people to ask their questions to our experts. So Again, thank you to our experts tonight, Dee and Ozzy. We appreciate you both joining us. And and thank you also to Jackson for hosting this great event. And we look forward to seeing you all again, September 30th. We'll see you then. Have a great evening, everyone.